Hey everybody, welcome. Uh, we are uh, very blessed today to be able to spend some time chatting with David Diamond. Uh, and I, I, I just wanted to welcome David to, uh, to our, our, our conversation this afternoon. David, amongst so many other things, is the curator of La Mama Umbria International, which is this incredible program in uh, Spoleto that uh, uh, I've been fortunate enough to be, be a part of. Lee Brock has done some uh, teaching there as well. And uh, there's someone. Uh, <laughs> um, anyway, uh, and uh, he also, David has a company of his own called Career Coaching for Artists, and we're going to talk all about that, and La Mama Umbria. And uh, David is also a co-founder and trustee of the Barrow Group. And then perhaps an interesting, and maybe the most interesting part of this, is David is my cousin. And we grew up together, and I'm sure we have lots to talk about there. Um, welcome, David. Thanks for dropping in. Hey, thanks. Glad to be here. <laughs> well, um, okay, let's start with the fun stuff. So uh, we, I have a memory a very specific memory of being tied up in <laughs> your brother's room uh, and uh, not being allowed, like, I, like you guys, your, your brother and my brother, uh, and I believe you tied me into to his room while playing some game or something. And I just remember I was furious and I was banging on the thing and I think I was crying with rage, you know, trying to get out of there. Um, and, uh, is that the memory you have? I don't recall that at all. That's like completely not true. Never happened. Oh no, it is definitely true. <laughs> I don't recall. <laughs> Sorry. Although, although in fairness, there is the flip side of this because you told me about a memory that you have that I have, I truly have no memory of, which is that somehow your brother and I tied you to a fire hydrant? That was Mark's memory, but Probably, I guess we were tying each other up a lot. In those days. <laughs> I mean, we were little kids. After maybe we weren't like in our twenties or something. <laughs> um, but you know, it used to be the case where every other summer, either my brother and I would go to Seth's family in California, or he would come to our family in Chicago, and uh, you know, we'd have the summer together. So. Yeah, lots of lots of fun times in those days. Yeah, I remember. I have very distinct memories of playing this game Shenanigans, which was a board game. Yeah, yeah, I remember that one. It's like based on a TV show, I think. Yeah. Oh, that was so good. I and I have such distinct memories of your basement and and your neighbors and setting off uh, rockets. We had these water. Oh, I think Mark, your your brother was really into, as I recall, like like rockets with actual. Uh, I don't know what you call it, but there was, you would light, light them a fuse and they had fuel and they would, yeah, yeah they'd go up and, and, uh, and parachute down and they sometimes would land like blocks away and we'd have to go find them yeah. and all this. That was fine. Do people really want to hear about this? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I remember well, I don't know. I want to talk about it. Uh, I remember anyway, being um, at your house and, uh, and, and, and a last, one last thing about our growing up. I yeah. believe we may have made our dramatic debuts together in we we did a uh, a radio show which we recorded on a cassette tape called the mummy's tomb mummy's revenge yeah oh, the mummy's revenge okay well there you go and uh i remember actually, that you found the cassette of that about 15 years ago and actually sent it to me <laughs> so i i have it and i have listened to about three minutes of it and that's as far as I could get. It's so stupid. So bad. <laughs> <laughs> but it's fun. Uh, anyway, um, well, you have uh, gone on to do such amazing things in your life. And, and I wanted to talk about some of that with you. Um, it might be interesting for you to talk about what you have going at La Mama Umbria. It's such an incredible program. And how did it start? What is it? Do you, to talk to us about that. Well, it started because I was uh, running the foundation of the Stage Directors Union, SDC, and, you know, trying to create programs to help directors, both career-wise and artistically. So that was my job. And on one summer, I was invited uh, to come to Italy by this amazing director, Larry Sakharov. If anybody's heard of him, he's no longer with us. But Larry invited me to a program he was running in Orvieto, Italy, in Umbria. And I remembered that Alan Stewart, who was the founder of La Mama, 
had uh, purchased a rundown convent in, in the hills not too far from there near, near Spoleto, and she was restoring it and renovating it. So I went over to see her after I finished um, seeing Larry, and uh, I, I just walked into the place and I thought, this is an amazing place. And I said to her, Ellen, you know, I'm working with all these directors. We should do kind of like a program here for directors, a symposium, we bring directors here. And uh, she's like, okay, baby, you do it. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> that was the beginning. And a year after that was the first symposium for directors, which uh, was in 2000. We just had our 20th year last summer. The uh, idea wow. of the symposium as, is that we bring great directors from around the world to come to La Mama and uh, participants come to take workshops with the different directors who have completely different perspectives and ways of approaching theater. So we might have uh, somebody doing viewpoints and somebody doing the Japanese puppet theater and somebody doing um, Meyerhold. And during the course of the summer, you would have uh, experience of working with each of these different artists as a director and hopefully learn new ideas and new ways that you could use yourself. Yeah, one of the things that struck me about it, and, and I sort of knew going into it, but you really experience it when you're over there in that environment, is the students themselves are from also all over the world. Uh, many of them, when I was there, weren't English speakers even, and, and uh, it, it was, although I would, most of them clearly were. And that in itself was an extraordinary uh, learning experience, just hanging out with these people that, came from cultural backgrounds that were so different. And, you know, I've always thought that peer-to-peer -peer learning is the, is the uh, strongest part of learning. You know, we learn from facilitators and teachers a lot, but we learn more from our peers. And that aspect of things was extraordinary. And of course, one other thing that was extraordinary is the woman who does all the cooking <laughs> there is maybe the best chef I've, <laughs> I've ever encountered. Every meal there was so, is so extraordinary. It's completely fresh, and um, a lot it, from our garden. Yeah, it, and and which is it's funny because it makes me almost sad to talk about here we are in the middle of this, you know, the virus and everything. And so to me that prompts a question, and the question is, this year uh, will the conference happen? And if so, how will it uh, how will it happen? What are your, what are your plans? Well, we've decided originally, you know, I had, we had planned to do the summer in Italy and we can't do that anymore, but the uh, teaching artists, the resident artists who were going to come to teach live workshops in person have all agreed to do a kind of remote uh, online version of the workshop. So it's different, you know, it's differently uh, arranged and scheduled. Uh, used to be each one was there for a week and now in a couple of days, they're going to have time uh, to work with the directors. It's an experiment because di teaching directing, as Seth knows, on a, on a Zoom platform is not always easy. But each of these directors, and this summer, we have people like um, Martha Clark and Michael Mayer and Richard Jones and um, Emily Mann and uh, a wonderful director from Palestine, Iman Aoun. Uh, coming to to lead the workshops and they've all come up with these great ideas about how they're going to use this platform to express and uh, share something about directing that's interactive. The whole idea is that it's not just listening to people talk. It's meant to be, you know, you get to work on something and then show it. So we're trying to figure out how, how that will work out. But yeah. uh, I'm excited about it and uh, I think it'll be really fun and different, but we'll see. Yeah, that's it's great, and that, what a great lineup that is. That, but we can't uh, send the meals around. That's the one problem. Yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> well, you know, next time. Um, and uh, I wanted to ask you also about you know your company, um, Career Coaching for Artists. Uh, what what is it? What do you do? How do you work with artists? All of that. What what is it? So uh, I also started that around the same time, around two thousand one. And the idea was to help artists understand um, a lot more about themselves and what they want in, in life as a, as a career as an artist and what's in their way. Like what do they see as blocking them from having the opportunities that they'd like to have? And then we work through those and try to um, 
get people to understand what's going on beyond uh, what their fears or blocks are so that they can, in an unfettered, clear way, move forward in the direction they want to move and uh, with a new perspective. And sometimes people's perspectives have uh, kind of narrowed as they're focusing in on, on one thing. And the process is about widening perspectives, seeing new opportunities, and then thinking about the different strategies that you may have to pursue what you want and learning new strategies or developing the ones you already have to make them more effective. And when uh, normally, like in circumstances when, when you know, non-COVID-19 circumstances, is this done live or do you typically do it with just people in phone sessions? Or, or another question I have is, is it a group kind of a thing or individual? How does it work? I've done both uh, groups and individuals. Usually if we can do it, if the person's in New York, we could do it in person. Otherwise, uh, phone or Skype have worked well for this kind of a thing. Uh, the groups that I've run uh, usually have been in-person groups. Uh -huh. Sometimes they're a group of people that are facing similar issues. So I had a, um, a group of women, uh, actually I did this one at the Barrow Group, a group of women who were all either ma just married or about to get married and thinking about how that relationship was going to affect their artistic work. And we sort of worked through a lot of that. I also okay. do a lot of teaching. So it's it's groups, again, it's coaching slash teaching at different universities, because right. as people are preparing to graduate, they're looking at this, you know, realm of possibilities of what they can do and how they can go about it. So it's a really good time for them to start thinking really strategically about what they want to do. So I do a lot of the university work now. And you've been, I know you've been doing this all over the world. Where are some of the places that you've gone to do this? Um, the I've gone to a lot of places and it's sometimes it's for coaching and sometimes it's to do other work that I um, do with um, um, you know um, just kind of exchanges with other artists and meeting directors meeting people that we might invite to the symposium so I spend time with the Sundance uh, theater project in Ethiopia I just got my second uh, CEC arts link grant to go to a residency in St. Petersburg. Yeah. Um, I've- Which you've been uh, to before, right? You did yeah, this, was, this is the second one in the same place. So originally when I went the first time, I met a lot of artists, artistic directors of companies, uh, freelance directors. And then I invited one of the people that I met to come to La Mama Umbria to teach a workshop. But this time it's about deepening those relationships. I'll be doing some teaching at the university there. And uh, the idea is that there'll be more opportunities for more uh, Russian artists to have more international experience. Wow. Do you, and do you, when you do this, do you usually work with a translator? Uh, or In Russia, I, I did have to work with a translator most of the time. Some people speak English, but yeah. In, in the, uh, it was really interesting in, in Ethiopia, there were, I think, a dozen directors and they were speaking like four different languages because they were from different East African countries and they all came together in Addis Ababa to do this workshop, which was led actually by a uh, wonderful director, Liesl Tommy, who many of you may know. Um, anyway, so the way that worked was Liesl was teaching in English but people were translating quietly to each other around the circle. So this person was speaking in French to that person, and that was, person was translating into Kiswahili, and that person to Anharic, and sort of went around the circle. And she didn't really have to stop very long between what she was saying, because it kind of just went in a beautiful, synchronized way. It's really cool. Do you find, when you're doing international workshops, do you find that the principles you're discussing and sharing with people are um, commonly understood and they have common application or are there different, <coughs> excuse me, are there cultural differences that require a different approach? How does that work? There always are cultural differences, but the core of what I'm working on really is about the person and the person understanding um, in a deep sense what they really want of their lives. I, I don't even think of it as career coaching as much as how do you live your life as an artist in the world? So what are the opportunities that are out there for you? What's standing in your way? And those kinds of things are really common to all artists. And so uh, it really doesn't matter 
what culture you're from, the thing that really matters about is the um, landscape of possibility for what you can do, the way things work. I spent some time in Palestine and Israel and the Palestinian theater companies, the theater artists in Palestine just don't have uh, some of the opportunities that people in other parts of the world might have. So within the scope of what they can do, how can they creatively um, design a way for them to move forward as an artist in their circumstances? I, I imagine through the course of doing this, you've seen lots of things that are sort of off the beaten path, uh, you know, performance pieces and everything. And I imagine some of those are, must have in, in blown you away. What, what are some of the more uh, memorable performance things you've seen? Oh, wow. Um, trying to think of one on the spot that has really been impactful. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, I'm having trouble thinking of one right now, but I'll come back to that. And see well, I, I mean, I'll share, I'll share something that, uh, Lee and I went to a performance of something that, and I don't know if you, this is a, I think, is it called Gray Rock? Is that what it was? Gray called? Rock, yeah. Gray Rock, yeah. Which is a piece that, uh, was produced in, in a, I don't know if that was officially a workshop or it, fe it felt like a workshop presentation of it, maybe. I don't know how they were. You went at La Mama? Yeah. So originally it was produced at La Mama through a company called Remote Theater Project, which is Alexandra Aaron's company. And what she did is she asked this Palestinian playwright director, Amir Nizar Zawabi, to create a play yeah. uh, based on uh, Palestinian experience. So all the actors were Palestinian yeah. that were in the play. He directed it, wrote it, and uh, well, you could tell your experience of it if you want. But. Well, the, this, the story of it, the, the, just the central story was, it was one of those things where the central story was just profoundly moving. And one of the things I found myself appreciating is, that, is was it, it, it was clearly the voice of uh, you know, an individual who was in a cultural context so different from the one which I'm familiar with, and I, the authenticity of it uh, just showed in spades, and it was just profoundly moving. And, and I'm thinking, you know, you're going all over the world, you must see that kind of thing a lot. Yeah, this was a particularly interesting piece because even though it was Palestinian, and the Palestinian people have all their issues and problems with, uh, you know, the way they have to live, this play was not about, um, you know, uh, fighting against Israel or terrorism or anything like that. It was about a family and about a guy who had amazingly creative ideas of things he wanted to do that everybody thought were impossible. Yeah. So the idea of the play is, you know, no matter our circumstances, we can still uh, dream big and we can still try to do, you know, things that seem impossible. So it was very moving. And it, yeah. since after that, the full production went to the public theater the following year and then to the Kennedy Center, to the Guthrie, and uh, then to Philadelphia, to a theater there. So um, yeah, That's I'm great. still in touch with all those, all those actors, they're great. That's great. Really great. The, and in your um, career coaching for artists company, um, who are the people that are, you know, tend to enroll in the workshops? And well, I, I guess, this is a pragmatic question even before I ask that or, or along with asking that, is how do people find out about uh, how to take these kinds of workshops if they wanna do that? Well, I could say 90% of people that I work with come through word of mouth. And it's just been kind of amazing to me. People will contact me I've never heard of and they'll say, oh, I heard you do this thing. Can we have a conversation? And every relationship um, with a, a client or with, some, with an artist that I have is got, is achieved through a conversation. It's all about having the conversation and deciding whether there's a reason and a, uh, to move forward and whether there's a compatibility between us so that we can communicate with each other. And, and is, there a, is there a website or something they can go to to find out information? Yes, there is. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, cool. what is it? DavidJDiamond.com davidjdiamond.com. Yeah, my middle initial in there. What, is J, what does J stand for? I actually don't know. You don't know? No. Jeremy. Jeremy. Yeah. I think I'm going to call you Jeremy from now on. 
I love the name Jeremy, and it's useful that I have the middle initial because there's another theater artist, you may know him, another David Diamond, oh, yeah. and the other David Diamond and I are constantly being confused with each other. Oh, what, is, uh, what does the other David Diamond do? He's also, you know, he's also in theater. He has a company, uh, I think it's called Headlines Theater in Vancouver, he's Canadian. He oh, works a lot with indigenous Canadian uh, population doing uh, Theater of the Oppressed work. Which oh, is, oh my uh, God, uh, there's really overlap. Um, Augusto Boa work, which I also do uh, here. Have, and, you worked uh, have you worked together? We never worked together. We only met in person once when he was in New York to receive uh, an award. And we went for lunch and we started to, you know, talk about, you know, it's interesting because we're the same age. We look a little bit alike. And um, yeah, it was just really freaky. To meet I remember, I remember your brother, Mark, who's a name, full name, obviously, I don't know his middle name, but Mark Diamond. And I remember, if I'm remembering this correctly, I think when he was in college, his roommate was Mark Diamond. Is that right? Uh, yeah, there was, I think this was in high school, but it was a Mark J and a Mark R. He's Mark yeah. R. Yeah, uh, crazy. Um, anyway, um, at this point, what uh, we're, we're going to do is, uh, oh, actually, do you have a question? Yeah. Oh, uh, co-artistic director Lee Brock is here. Uh, and, hey, Lee. And, and uh, she's going to come in and ask you a question. Come on in, Lee. David. Hi, David. Um, hi, Lee. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, sure. David Diamond is one of the kindest people on the planet and one of the biggest supporters of artists that I know. You are, you're extraordinary. And just even talking about some of those tools, I mean, you, Seth, myself, we are hopefully trying to inspire artists and uh, enhance their work. So you were talking about uh, some tools to help them, uh, maybe specifically some of those things, maybe one or two tools that you could throw out that helps. Because it's, a, it's less about um, the idea of, you know, planning for a big future for yourself. It's more about uh, understanding yourself and allowing your career to unfold. So a lot of the, um, the tools that you might call them, I really do separate it into like the idea of who you are and what you want as an artist in your life, how you want to live your life and other tools that can help you get there. So the tools part of it is um, how do I write a better resume? What should my website look like? How do I have a conversation with another artist to try and get a position? Uh, what's the best way to um, navigate through the industry? Mm -hmm. So there are those tools, but the, mm -hmm. the heart of it really is questions about um, in the biggest sense, what do you, how do you want to live your life and what do you want from your life and how does your creative life uh, coexist with other things that you need and want, like relationships, money, uh, money's a big one. The biggest question I get from people all the time is, how do I have an artistic career and still make enough money to live? Right. That is right. by and far the, the biggest question. And working through the answers to that question is unique for each person, right. but it, a lot of it depends on, well, what is your relationship to money? How does it, what's right. the emotional connection? Not just, oh, I need enough money to pay the rent, but people yeah. have a lot of emotional feelings about money. Yes. And so we talk through that as well. Yes. I uh, love, one of the things that uh, I got from you, which I use a lot, is um, uh, your simple sentence, the quality of your experience. So sometimes, you know, when people, you know, young actors go, I just want that Broadway show. I just want that film. I just want this. And your simple sentence about really looking for what is the quality of your experience. And hopefully we're looking for that as artists, as people that, you know, as uh, in life that, uh, that we might be going after that Broadway show, but still you're doing this amazing play in the Lower East Side, which uh, with amazing artists, which is having an incredible response on people, which hopefully that's the thing that might be filling us up as, as artists and uh, having an effect on people uh, and just kind of reframing that a little bit. So it really is about the quality of your experience, each experience that you have, Absolutely. and that knowing that every single experience has such incredible value to, uh, 
learn from. So I stole that from you. And um, <laughs> you're welcome to it. <laughs> uh, there we go. And throw that out to uh, help people sometimes when it's like, ah, I just want, we're in New York City, want that Broadway show, want that film. It's like, okay, just, you know, how, how's your scene going in class right here, right now? Um, yeah, life is lived uh, in moments. Like, if you think that, oh, I can't be happy until I achieve this thing, then you're missing a lot of stuff along the way. Why not be happy all the time? And then when you achieve that thing, that's fine, but it won't define how you allow yourself to be happy. Right. Dave and I have the same philosophy in that respect. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're a very inspiring person yourself. Oh, so are you. So are you. Hmm. So, uh, so great. So maybe we, I'm going to bring along uh, Mr. Seth Ferris uh, here. Mr. Seth, <laughs> Mr. Seth Ferris. Mr. Aren't they Seth fun? Ferris. They kind of look alike, um, uh, David. And, uh, and this beautiful, beautiful relationship of 34 years, David has been just so devoted to the Barrow Group in every capacity. Uh, he started out as our managing director. He started out just with... Uh, coming to see every single thing that we have seen, has uh, sat on that board for 34 years, has been the president when, the, when a new president comes in and he uh, takes over the, being the president again, but has this been- This one that can't find anybody else. <laughs> but has been so devoted to the arts and to La Mama and to the Bear Group and to nurturing thousands and thousands of artists. And what you've done in Umbria is, just astonishing. So it, it, we're thinking that at this point, this would be a good time to just, just to open this up for questions. So if you have a question uh, out there in Zoom land, uh, feel free to raise your hand through the participants button. And there's a little button there that says raise hand and we'll see it and we'll call on you. Um, while we're waiting for folks to, to log in any questions that they might have, uh, we can talk about we could talk about some other things. Um, I'm wondering, you know, since you've been at, with the Bear Group since its inception, yeah. what are some of the standout moments that you remember? <laughs> at, at the Barrow Group? Yeah. Oh gosh, there, there are a lot of those. I mean, from the early days, um, you know, seeing a play like uh, Blue Window at the Corner Loft, so, <laughs> sticks out to me and uh you know when you're coming back red rider and mm -hmm. i mean a lot of the early plays i guess they hold a, a special place in my heart because nobody knew who we were nobody you know it was like we were just doing this little these little things but there was so much um really extraordinary work being done uh by the artists that people started to you know understand what the barrow group was and started to come to shows and it really it built on itself and so there were a lot i mean the um k2 i mean just a uh, uh, blue blue window um uh, no i said that one what's the um the one with all the chairs and the map store lonely planet, lonely oh, lonely planet, planet by yeah. stephen uh, deeth that lenny beautiful. directed with dennis and mark Right, beautiful. Yeah, Dennis O'Hare. Dennis O'Hare and, and Mark the late Shannon. Mark Shannon. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, play. that was great. And so, but there's been so many of them over the years. I mean, um, but I think those early days were really exciting. Nobody, you know, we were all just kind of getting our feet wet with the whole thing, and it was uh, it's kind of thrilling. Yeah, that's cool. Right. I think Adam uh, had a comment. I don't know if he had a question because um, Adam I, Auslander. Yeah. So I kind of go uh, like. I haven't seen I, you ages okay so, so right, what you do there Adam. lee let me just show so, okay, you, you, you don't like, don't even touch it okay so this is like lee and seth doing um, technology and, right uh, so did you see when i went over here he kind of get, gave a look like what is you doing what yeah, is you doing don't touch it because it's touch not it. good but um, i see that uh benjamin culpepper does have a well, question adam was saying how does david look exactly the same uh for and 34 years how does he look exactly the same so adam <laughs> oh, very kind adam <laughs> <laughs> yeah so I'll benjamin. for me Oh, yes, sir. Uh, so, uh, uh, so Benjamin, do you want to come in and do you have a question, Benjamin? I do. Hi, I Benjamin. do. Hi, everyone. Uh, hi, David. Uh, pleasure to get to know you through this. Um, I love the, uh, the idea of we, you know, every life is lived moment to moment. Um, so I, I really want to kind of dive a little bit deeper into that and to ask you, what do you think are some universal uh, moments that are very important in a young artist's life. 
What do you think are moments that are important in anybody's life? I think is the is a good question because an artist, while an artist has an idea of wanting to express themselves in certain ways, it's it's more of a, a human thing than just an artist thing. So I don't think there are particular um, circumstances where an artist should feel any particular way. I think it's um, being present with people, enjoying the work that you're doing, um, getting into what we would call like a creative flow where you're not even thinking about what other people are thinking about you or what you're thinking about yourself or just being in that creative space. Those are the moments that I think for anybody are, are really great. David, why do you think people are in any way preoccupied with what people think of them and stuff? What is that about? I think it's such a human, uh, you know, human thing. We're always kind of in this process of evaluating ourselves. <laughs> and a lot of times we see ourselves how we think other people see us. Uh -huh. The reality of the situation is that we're often wrong when we think about the way people think of us. So to be in a situation where you're going to allow your confidence or your self image to be based on what you think other people think of you is, is you know, it's a, a bad rabbit hole to go down. But I think in general people, it's, I think it's a very human thing for us to care what other people think about us. Are there specific techniques or exercises that people can do to help steer their attention off of that, that you know, rabbit hole of what do other people think of me and, and get their attention on just doing what they do? It's, it's a, um, a, a more of a, a quieting of the mind that allows, because we have a lot of thinking about a lot of things that are not relevant to uh, the creation of art. Mm -hmm. So the more that we can quiet ourselves down enough to feel the inspiration and the insight that's coming through us, it's like an energy that comes through us so that we can be really creative people, um, then it, uh, it, can, it just flows. But it's like not the type of thing where you could say, I'm not going to think about these things because that's a sure way to get yourself to think about something is to tell yourself not to think about it, right? Sure. Oh, you know, don't think of an elephant right now. Everybody thinks of an elephant, right? Because you can't really um, manipulate your mind in that way. But what you can do is um, be centered, be, be present, and uh, as much as you can, allow whatever thoughts come through, just go through you and, and pick out the ones you really want to focus on that are going to be of assistance to you as a creative artist. David, what are some things that, uh, tools that you do to help people quiet their minds or calm their systems down? Uh, it's, a, it's a kind of um, a noticing, like pointing out when people are either uh, making assumptions that may or may not be true. Um, this is why coaching is more of a conversation than a list of uh, a series of things that you can do. It's more about oh, I see that you're making assumptions. What do you think about that? Um, I see that you know, you're letting this, this thinking that you're going through um, obsess you so much that you can't do other things that you wanna do in your life. And when people start to see what's really going on, it's almost naturally goes away. But, but if somebody doesn't point it out to you, a lot of times it just keeps going and going and you, you can't get rid of it. Wow. Mm -hmm. Oh, mm -hmm. Benjamin, by the way, thank you for, very much for that, that question. Benjamin, did uh, that answer yeah. your question, Benjamin? Because Benjamin went away. Yeah, okay, all right. Good. <laughs> um, um, David, do you meditate? Go. Do you meditate, David? Not in the sense of a formal meditation, but, okay. you know, when I'm uh, working out, when I'm doing certain things, it's kind of get myself into a kind of meditative state. But uh -huh. no, I, don't, I know you do, right? You meditate. Don't? I do, but the uh, but I think just even like what you're saying is just uh, observation, uh, noticing uh, things will kind of calm the the system down a little bit, calm the mind down. And I love and totally agree what you're saying with when you're calming your your system down, then that that enables you to kind of listen to other inspiration that's going to come up and guide you as an artist. Lee, for you, when you're performing in specifically, what are the, some of the things that you do oh. to just kind of quiet yourself? Or do you, do you do any kind of ritualistic quieting before you play or, or how does that work? Uh, quieting before I play. 
That's a really good question, Seth. Well, I mean, the reason I ask is that I've, in a sense, I've noticed that you have certain rituals. They're not cliche, like, you know, going out and, you know, necessarily doing stretching or anything like that, but you'll usually show up. No, 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 I do do a ritual. That's, uh, that's true. So uh, that ritual for me is, uh, I don't think of it so much of quieting the mind, but quieting myself. I need to look at the script twice a day. Uh, for me. So in the morning, like when I used to have big, uh, big parts, when mm -hmm. lips together to the part or those kind of things I would get on the exercise bike and make sure that I was um, looking at the text in the morning. And then I always make sure that I get to the theater about a half an hour, hour before. So I, again, spend time with the script. So just looking at the script, I'm a visual person. So I kind of need to look at the script as going over all of that. Um, a couple of, you know, a couple of times just, uh, so I guess that's quieting myself in that respect to the, the artistic process. Yeah, it seems like, right. it. I mean, I noticed that it's something of a ritual in that. Like, yeah, like it know. would never go on, just like running into the yeah. theater and then running. Do you out. have any, Seth? Uh, you know, um, I do <laughs> run my lines with the actors if they're willing backstage. Um, because I like to, when I'm playing, not be thinking about lines at all. And so, Sometimes that will help. We'll just really quickly just sort of speed through stuff. And most of the time actors are willing. And if I sense that they're not, I don't ask them to do it. And so funny, because we were talking about that, like different processes, uh, an actor's process, uh, like it would never run lines with somebody before uh, a show. Whereas that's a kind of a, a, a visual thing for me. But Seth would go, let's run lines, let's run lines, because he's very auditory. So um, it's a different practice uh, for him. Yeah. Although in, in, you know, full disclosure, you know, Lee and I are married and, and when we've done every once in a while, it's pretty rare, but every once in a while we do a play uh, where we're both in it together. And uh, we did, gosh, I don't know how many years ago now, like that, 10, 10 years, years ago, we running. did a, a play that Arlene Hutton wrote and it was I a had two, lines. it was, I don't think that's true. <laughs> uh, it was a two hander and we both, you know, it was pretty much, my memories is pretty much split between us. But in any case, we would go through the lines quite a bit, uh, especially before rehearsal started, just kind of every night we'd be like, all right, let's, let's, let's run some lines until we fall asleep or something. Well, every, yeah. that, that was a lot, there were a lot of lines for the, the two of us there. And uh, I think it was like, we would wake up in the morning, do the lines. Uh, we were doing the lines constantly for that play, but um, there you go. But David, yes. I hope, so you guys, you. I hope everybody here gets a chance to see you guys on stage together because it's a really <laughs> real treat. Great. Uh, maybe we should see if any other people have uh, questions here, but thank you for sharing those uh, tools on how to quiet yeah. your um, There's a Anna Kakarian. Anna, Anna. Uh, Anna uh, go ahead and unmute and turn on your your uh, video and what's what's your question? Oh right, 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 right. Hello. Hi, Anna. Hi. 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 Um. So I just thought I I would think that you're flooded with people trying to get your help in in this way and and. Um, if let's say if you are, do you uh, do you have to turn people away sometimes and say, "Hey, I I just have too many people," or or are you not flooded with people? <laughs> Asking. Um, it depends on the time of year more than anything because of this other thing I do all summer away in Italy. So people are usually finishing up a process or taking a pause at the uh, beginning of the summer, and then when I come back in the fall, it's kind of a process of regenerating and people either people coming back or new people coming in so i wouldn't say i'm always flooded but i think that it's about a lot of it's about time and schedule so i try not to turn people away but try to find ways to fit people into a schedule um but uh yeah sometimes i've been i've been pretty crowded i have to take care of my own time and how much yeah. doing this kind of thing um it takes a lot of Actually, it takes a lot of energy just to be present with somebody, as you may Yeah, know. I can imagine. So I, I do it as much as I possibly can um, to accommodate everybody, but you know, I have, a, have to have a limit on that too. But if you're interested, let's talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Thanks, Anna. Thanks. Great question. Um, 
And we are uh, you know, David? so lucky that also oh, that we uh, were able to do so many incredible plays at La Mama. And La Mama is an amazing um, uh, theater and so supportive of so many uh, actors and artists and, uh, and so, you know, so gifted that we were able to uh, get to know Ellen Stewart and be a part of, uh, you know, um, La Mama during, during that time in the Lower East Side. And she would just open her arms to everybody that would uh, come in, uh, smaller theater companies that were struggling and give everybody a chance. And we were, were so grateful. The Bear Group is yeah. so grateful that we were able to do so many shows there. We did Tales from Hollywood there. We did Walking the Blonde there. We did um, God's Country, beautiful uh, play by Stephen Dietz. And uh, she- Well, you asked me before about, you know, shows I've seen that had a big impact and around the world, it seems like the world was always coming to La Mama because they had plays there from all right. over. Right. One of the companies right. that always struck me very strongly is called Belarus Free Theater. Yes. And they're a company of, of artists who were basically kicked out or had to leave Belarus and yes. most of them are in London now, but they a lot of them can't go back to their families because of the government. And so, uh, but their the work is really strong. Right. Yeah. And so constantly all of the stuff that is happening, uh, that I, I love that sentence that uh, the world has come to New York and Ellen Stewart was just... Uh, the conduit for all of those incredible artists to come to New York and have that New York experience. And that's still happening now and it's, it's flourishing, which is uh, fantastic. And we're yeah. so grateful that we were able to do so many plays there and uh, be a part of that. It was a great inspiration to me and to a lot of people. Yeah. 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 Um, well, uh, time beyond, you know, more than flies when you're having fun and, and believe it or not, that is, <laughs> we've just blown through our, our time. Um, I want to hear more stories about, you know, David and Seth, though. I mean, oh, I, uh, <laughs> part two. I don't, think, I don't know if we have. Uh, but in any case, um, David, I really wanted to thank you for joining with us today. It's so interesting hearing about all that stuff. It's, you know, completely related to so much of what we do. And it's also a little bit uh, tangential. And it's kind of interesting to get to be able to get into this stuff. And uh, I just, you know, thanks for taking the time to, you know, pop in with us. Sure, any time we get to spend with you guys is, is good. So yeah. thank you. Uh, and we send our uh, good wishes to everyone that has been with us uh, today. And we hope that everyone stays uh, healthy and mm -hmm. calm and uh, that you're taking this time to discover new things about yourself and your families and your loved oh, ones. One other thing I, I feel like to mention quickly, a little uh, commercial. I, um, on Fridays at noon, New York time, I've been leading a conversation for theater artists where we get to talk about everything that's going on now and what people are thinking about and uh, share a kind of community together. How do they, how do people access that? Uh, they could just email me um, at uh, ddjdstar um, at, uh, at gmail.com. I could, you could put it in the um, chat or um, you could post it somewhere. It's also on my website. People go to the website, which is already posted. DDJDstar at gmail. Gmail.com. Okay, great. So yeah, let me know and I'll send you the Zoom link. Uh, it's free. It's open to anybody. Right. Um, but it's been, they've been really um, meaningful conversations. So please right. join if you want. Good. All righty. Well, thanks so Good. much. Thanks, everybody. Have, thanks, a great, have a great week. Uh, make sure that you check out uh, Barrow Group's programming and you can do that at barrowgroup.org. There's all sorts of online uh, programming, free programming that we have going every week. Uh, we have a tea with Lee and Seth on Mondays and a, a, a sample acting class that we do on regularly on Tuesdays. And we have uh, our, our conversations with artists on uh, Wednesday evenings every, every, and next week, our guest, is, who's next week? Next week is Marsha Marcia DeBonis, DeBonis yeah, who's Marcia one DeBonis. of the original uh, members of the Barrow Group and a casting director and extraordinary actress and, and all of that. So uh, we'll be talking with Marsha next week. And, uh, and then of course we have our regular programming as well. So go to barrowgroup.org to check out that stuff. And I think that's about it. We'll, we'll say goodbye. I think that's good. Okay, okay. stay healthy, stay happy and stay calm. Okay, right. thank you. Bye. Be well, everybody. Bye. <laughs>